Hey everyone, welcome to the Question Behavior Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Merle van den Akker, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Sarah Bowen. Hi, it's me, sat here next to you virtually. <laughs> virtually. <laughs> You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy that don't believe Hey everyone, science. welcome to another episode of the Questioning Behavior Podcast. And the behavior that we're questioning today actually has everything to do with emotions. So now that we're on this topic, Sarah, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good, actually. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't really thinking about what emotional state I'm currently in when you asked that question. So now you've got me actually thinking, how am I? Um, (laughs) How am I? Who am I? Where am (laughs) I? (laughs) Sorry, excuse me while I just have this existential crisis. But no, no, I think I'm, I think I'm good. How, how are you, Mella? What's, what's up with you? Yeah, now I feel like I I should go like much deeper than you know. Normally, it's like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm well. You know, just a bit tired because that's a basic answer everyone gives. Oh, busy, busy is another answer to that question. (laughs) Uh, Everyone says they're busy. I don't know how they're busy all the time, and I find it very impressive. Uh, I'm worrisome at the same time. But now that I have to think about in my emotions, I'm quite relaxed. Okay, um, that's good. Yeah, feel quite relaxed, feel quite energized, feel quite excited for this episode because I like emotional decision making. Uh, I think it's... Uh, I like... I, because I'm, I'm effectively a psychologist by training, so I think it's... Uh, it's it's nice to to dive deeper into people's emotions. I also like kind of if, if you know we're, we're close to each other, and don't do this <laughs> to strangers. But I kind of like fucking about with people's emotions, not in like a bad way, but like I didn't I, know I, where that sentence was going. I yeah, no, I I know. <laughs> no, it's just I I find it uh, if, if we're like close enough, I find it funny to see how how quickly I can get someone angry. I don't know why. Oh my god, you're so manipulative. What's going on? I'm a psychologist. <laughs> Don't you have a responsibility? You know, no, you, you, you have no. these weapons of mass influence at your at your disposal. Mate, have you ever met a psychologist with a moral code? Also, look who's talking. You're a fucking economist. I've never met an economist with a moral code. Well, at least I don't try and manipulate people. Well, no, I guess that's a lie. <laughs> okay, <Liar>. well <laughs> back to the okay, topic. So... Emotional decision making. Sarah, which emotion hmm. helps you best to make decision and which emotion do you think influences your decision making the most in a negative way? Um, well, I think the behavioral scientist response is always it depends, but mm-hmm. such an such an annoying response, isn't it? Yeah, um, the worst sort of emotional state I can be in when making decisions is anxiety, I think. Sure. Just because it causes me to overthink, overthink and just be a bit miserable and worried. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I think generally a neutral state is quite good. I think mm-hmm. if you're in sort of a neutral, relaxed state, you can sort of just think about things a little bit more clearly. Um, emotion doesn't sort of tinge the decision making. Although why should that be a bad thing? I don't know. But um what about you, Mel? I feel like you have a, a pre-recorded response to this question. It was so no, I asked. don't. <laughs> no, I don't. Don't be like that. No, for me, I think the worst emotion is very similar to yours. I think it's a state of fear or anxiety because it's kind of crippling. Um, I, mm-hmm. I mean, to, to experience a, a level, a, a non-clinical level of anxiety is quite normal. I mean, everyone gets scared sometimes, even if that's just about, you know, thinking about the future mm-hmm. or everyone else around me has figured out their finances, you know, and, and I still haven't, or I don't know where I'm <laughs> going to be in, in 18 months. Maybe it might be on the yeah. other side of the world. Oh my God, what am I doing with my life? Should I know what I'm doing with my life? Et cetera, okay. et cetera. Okay, Mella, you're okay. Yeah. You're okay. I'm, 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 priming, I'm priming my own anxiety here. I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot before we even finish this recording. And then... I think the other emotion that for me is like the most useful or like the most productive is anger. I like getting mm. angry. It's very productive. If I'm angry, like I'm like, you know, like all the voices in my head, like fucking shut up. You're useless. Now let's just, you know, oh let's just God. do this. No, but it's like you can turn anger against yourself. You can turn anger against other people. But in like a state of anger, like what are you going to do? You're super hyped. You're super energized. And I'm not a violent person, so I don't really go out, you know, beating up people or objects because I'm angry. I just 
tries to channel my energy in any useful direction. And I think anger for me is like the mo- the emotion with the most energy behind it. So okay. if I'm angry, I get to work. So do you ever try to prime anger in yourself? If you're like, okay, I've, I've really got to do loads of writing today, quick. No, so... no, no, no. Because anger, no? Is, is, because anger in itself is destructive and distracting. Right, yeah. I mean, I'm just imagining you as the Incredible Hulk now. I hope. Thanks. Hope that's okay. I'm My just... eyes are green. It could work. Well, there you go. So you guys have a lot in common. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I'm also, you know, uh, one mass of pure testosterone, muscle mass, and anger. Well, I well, I'm intimidated. I don't know about anyone else. I see. <laughs> well, I think uh, before we we delve too deeply into our own issues and <laughs> um, apparent uh, anger issues, which I hey I didn't hey know hey, I don't have anger issues. <laughs> I'm just saying okay. I can use anger for good. <laughs> Leave me okay. alone. <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're just revealing a lot of yourself today. I think it's I think it's very good. But um, I, I, I think we should uh, now turn our conversational efforts towards someone who has a bit more knowledge in this field. So who are we talking to today, Mella? We are talking to Nick Hobson, which I think a lot of people might know already, if it's not just for his his work in emotional decision making uh, or his work in general. Probably people will know him for his very, very nice podcast, which will also be linked down below, in which he also very much interviews people. It seems to be quite a common format. (laughs) I don't think we've reinvented the wheel here. Uh, but yeah, I think it's time to talk to uh, to Nick Hobson and see what he has to say about emotional decision making. And maybe he can explain my problem with anger. Or actually, my, my non-problem with anger. Yes. Yeah, own yeah. it, Mala. Please, yeah, own it. Yeah, own it. Anyway, let's dive into it. So today's expert on the topic of emotional decision making is actually Nick Hobson. So Nick, kick us off. Who are you? <laughs> Who am I? That we were just talking before we hit record, and, and now in the last thirty seconds, I was like going through this existential, <laughs> philosophical questioning of who am I? What do I do? But uh, I guess elevator pitch is mm-hmm. I am a applied behavioral scientist, uh, but perhaps more accurately, I'm a social psychologist by training. So I have a PhD in in experimental social psychology and, and social affective neuroscience. Hence the topic of emotions and decision making. But mm-hmm. as I left academia and went into practice and sold out, <laughs> I um, I guess I rebranded myself to call, and now I refer to myself as a behavioral scientist. Um, and, Easier to market. Yes. Yeah, so I, I actually had a long, long winding conversation on Christian Hunt's podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Human Risk Podcast, which I think he released the episode recently this week. And yeah, we, we went into that topic of why why do we refer to ourselves as behavioral practitioners, behavioral scientists, behavioral designers, behavioral blank, and mm-hmm. not the psychology part. Um, and there's a good reason. I, in, in a very short, it's it's because behavior is, is easier to market. It's more mm-hmm. observable. You get more buy-in from external stakeholders who aren't scientists. Because as soon as you start to mention psychology, they're like, well, what are you? Are you a psychotherapist? Are you are you oh, a yeah. psychiatrist? Are you going to cure right. my, mental, my mental health disorder? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, are, are you Freud? Just, you know, just ask <laughs> Exactly. My family honestly still thinks I'm a, like, they're like, so do you do therapy? I'm like, no, God, I've been telling you this for like 20 years. <laughs> I'm not a therapist, right? So, so yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a behavioral scientist slash social psychologist, and I'm the chief behavioral scientist of The Behaviorist, which is my uh, consulting business. And I also do some advising strategy work um, uh, with organizational change. And my main sort of offering in, in the work that I do with clients centers around um, emotions, as we'll mm-hmm. talk about today. Uh, team emotions, collective performance, org performance, culture change, and ritual. So, well uh, done. What I do. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, and then lastly, I'll say I'm I'm a writer and lecturer, so I do a lot of writing, and I continue to lecture at some universities in the area, mostly at University of Toronto. Um, and really, if I had to say my mission or my, my my goal is to is to sit at the intersection between academia and practice, so that we can have those two worlds having more conversations and fruitful conversations. All right, <laughs> you are what we like to call a hybrid. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is which is uh an amazing term that comes up again and again when, when we when we speak to people and i just mm-hmm. i just love it i love i want to speak to as many hybrids as possible because yeah, a foot in both worlds gives you a very interesting perspective uh on both which uh yes yep. fascinating keeps you in check yes yeah for sure definitely keeps you grounded both mm-hmm. feet on the floor but so obviously you got into, I guess, this area of research through a very academic uh, pathway through the PhD. So what made you decide to do the PhD in the first place? And then what made you decide to leave academia once you'd got your PhD? Good question. So I'll try and keep this brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> might, be a bit, might be a bit triggering for me. You might see me like launch into a full-blown panic attack here. Um, so PhD, why did I do a PhD? I, um, I actually had a great professor, introductory psychology professor, many, many years ago, in my first year undergraduate. And I was in pre-med. I was I wanted to be a real doctor, like a medical doctor for, yeah, for well, as long as you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then life life had its own plans, set of plans for me. Uh, but but I, I had to take this compulsory intro psych class. I never thought about psychology before. And then this this professor, Professor Dick Day at McMaster University in, in Ontario, Canada, uh, who's still teaching, by the way, um, oh. into his eighties, I believe. He wow. he is just probably one of the best most inspiring professors. And he set me on this new path. Um, He sort of opened me up to the field of psychology, neuroscience and behavioral science. And it was then and there uh, that I decided I would not do pre-med and that I wasn't going to become a a medical doctor, but instead I wanted to become a a PhD in Mm -hmm. psychology and behavioral science. So uh, yeah, fast forward a few years later, got into grad school and, and did my master's and, and PhD at the University of Toronto, working with Mickey Inslicht in the social affective neuroscience lab. Nice. And that's where I started to really get into um, uh, yeah, the topics I men- mentioned earlier. So emotions, emotion decision making, and all how it relates to neuroscience. And we were sort of an interesting lab because we were a blend, sort of very interdisciplinary we were trained social psychologists, but we used cognitive neuroscience methods and borrowed f- from JDM, judgment and decision-making literature, um, a- as well as some insights from anthropology and sociology. So it was, yeah, very, very broad in terms of my, my training. Um, and then to your second, your second question, why did I leave academia? It was partway through grad school, I realized that I the job market was getting just tougher and tougher for for graduate students who were leaving their PhD. And I saw my my fellow lab mates who were a couple years my senior going on the job market and doing job interviews and 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 ultimately deciding to to stick with it. But they had to sacrifice where they chose to live. And and so they had to live in places that they did not want to live, but they they've chose them because they wanted to really sort of follow that academic path. Um, Mm -hmm. And I decided for me and my family that we needed to stick within a certain geographic region. And then I quickly did some very simple math and arithmetic to realize (laughs) that the probability of me actually getting a job at that time in this location was very, very, very slim, even though I had a decent track record for a decent amount of publications and all that stuff. It's, It's just really, really difficult for a junior academic coming in or you know an academic coming into that first junior professor position yeah we we are aware <laughs> yeah yeah that's I mean, we're a bit of a soft spot probably a little bit of a for you guys right a, yeah. a, a bit <laughs> yeah it's it's creating a, a bit of an emotional response in me right now i'm trying to yeah you're sweating i, I am sweating. i'm <laughs> internally crying so yeah. you know it's uh, lots of emotions here which is which is which is good so yeah. from from my perspective, if if I figure if I think about emotional decision making, the first thing that comes to mind is just me being hangry, which is not very scientific, I'm afraid. So within within your PhD and and throughout your own research, what type of emotional decision making did you look into? What what fascinated you about it? So so emotions and affective science is is really interesting because. For, for decades, it was thought as as unimportant and sort of mm-hmm. insignificant in the role of psychology broadly and specific within decision making. Um, and there's a reason for that. There, like, if we look, if we go way back, if we go way back to like ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, sort of Western ph- philosophical traditions, and then also theology and religion mm-hmm. <clears throat> of like two thousand plus years ago. Um, those theologians and philosophers and, and ancient thinkers 
didn't give a shit about emotions and they actually <laughs> thought that they were like sort of the 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 the, the bad side of of humans and, and human behavior they were seen as sort of an un- unnecessary byproduct and mm-hmm. instead what it meant to be human was sort of to be cold and logical and cold calcu- have cold calculated reason mm-hmm. our faculties our uniquely human faculties were to be um rational mm-hmm. the rational animal and that was the attempt to really distinguish and separate us from the other non-human animal species um and you can see how religion ties into this like we have what's in christianity called the seven deadly sins and i'm pretty sure every major religion has some version of it yeah. where the, the the thinking is that the more emotional we are the closer to like hell like the closer to, to <laughs> Or the further away we are from God or from whatever divine okay. being we we subscribe to, whatever belief mm-hmm. we subscribe to. So that, you know, thousands of years later, the Western tradition of of the of that philosophy and of of that mostly Judeo-Christian thinking uh then went on to influence our science of psychology of the of the nineteenth and twentieth century, where emotions were un at best unimportant and a byproduct, and at worst sort of um uh would steer us off the off the off the path mm-hmm. when it came to making the right decisions it was almost sure. like the right decisions were made um in a, in a very emotionless way and let, let's mm-hmm. just get emotions off away out, out to the out to the side because they're they're not they're they're going to throw us off our game sure. so that's the history and that's what i find really interesting and then and then this work in the 80s 90s and 2000s with neuroscience all came on the scene mm-hmm. where emotions were very very important um Mm -hmm. they aren't just a byproduct they are central to our very basic human psychology it also Mm -hmm. is the thing which um ties us into like our evolutionary history with other animals other animals experience rich emotional lives just as humans do so it's and like sorry to burst anyone's bubble like humans aren't really all that unique Uh, (laughs) oops (laughs) but we like to think we like to think we are um but when you realize that i think the 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 power of emotions and the power of decision making and, and behavior is 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 really revealed to you that there's this rich history uh, shared mm-hmm. evolutionary history that we have and emotions are absolutely core to our uh to our human nature so that's what really brought me onto it and um some work that i did maybe to bring this into to make it a little bit more concrete i was interested in how um the perception of our own emotional visceral states guided our moral and ethical decision making Mm-hmm. So uh, this is a paradigm that's used often in social psychology and experimental psychology called the false somatic feedback. So the way the way it works is is like this. So I'll just sort of walk through the design for listeners. Um, so you have two conditions, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of ex- explain this in a way if 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 your non scientist listeners are tuning in. Sure. Uh, so we have our, our two conditions. We have a control condition and an experimental condition. Both groups, individuals in both groups are set up to um, this physiological monitor. So it, it looks like a, you know, a set of electrodes that go on their sort of their chest and their neck. Um, and that detects their physiological reactivity or their heart rate, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could also do skin sweating, galvanic skin response as well, if you if you want. And you have this wire that runs off and it and it feeds into the back of a of a device, this sort of computer looking device. And you tell the participant, look, we're we're measuring your heart rate and you you put a set of headphones on them and you say you can actually hear your heart rate. (laughs) But it's all a lie. Oh, so (laughs) that that wire actually runs into the back of a computer and is just taped with masking tape and it leads to nothing. Yay. So why, why that's so amazing is you can intentionally manipulate the pace or the, how fast the heart rate is that each participant is listening to. So in the control condition or in condition one, they're hearing a, a steady normal heart rate, which is like do 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 okay and then in the experimental condition where what you want to do is arouse you want to you want to induce a state of high arousal in those participants so what they hear is do 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 okay do-do. stop please stop you can stop <laughs> <laughs> and so and then and then you you have um you have them read something like a passage of of some sort of information or you put or it could be you put them in through a test let's say 
and you have the control group, which is low arousal. They're okay. Their heart rate is beating as it normally, as what they think it normally should. And then in the experimental condition, the high arousal condition, people are thinking, oh my God, my heart sounds like it's going to beat out of my chest. Even though, of course, it's not their heart rate. It's, 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 it's totally intentionally manipulated and planned. And then now that you have that sort of figured out, then you put all participants in both groups through an ethical dilemma. Uh-huh. And you say, uh, sort of like a prisoner's dilemma or, a, or an ultimatum game. And you say, here's, um, and, and that could vary, but, but, but the, you know, the gist of it is you have a certain amount of money that you can give away to another anonymous stranger. How much money do you want to give? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the question is, how does, emo- how does the perception or the, the meta awareness of our emotional visceral state affect the likelihood of whether we're going to be charitable and give more or less money to another individual stranger? Um, and what we found is that the more aroused, um, the, the, i.e. the faster the heart rate that the, that, the, that the person had, the more likely that they were going to be charitable, that they were going to give money away. Hmm. Ah. So, so that's one, one example of, um, of sort of how you can manipulate the emotional state of an individual in a laboratory context um, and then see how it actually impacts uh, decision making. Um, oh, neat. It's a really cool example. I mean, it it sparks a lot of questions in my mind. Like, for example, how important is it, do you find, that people are aware of their emotional state when it comes to making decisions? Is it sort of about recognizing how you're feeling or does it not matter if people can't put a name to the emotions that they're currently experiencing? feeling it does yeah so emotional meta awareness and emotional recognition is is a is a huge component of of sort of overall mental well-being and, and psychological health um so that is actually a component that you see that is common in a lot of psychopathology is an inability to label an emotion mm-hmm. and it just feels like a an amorphous blob of chaos that's experienced in the individual um and emotions we also know are deeply as I said earlier, they're visceral. They're sort of these bodily sensations, these somatic sensations that are rooted in, you know, the torso and different parts of the body. Um, and we also know that people who experience very disturbing and troubling mental health, mental illness, and psychopathology have a have a, a disconnect between mind and body. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost as the two aren't sort of talking to one another. So um, you need the body and the emotional states of the body to be in concert with our cognition, with our mind, so that we know how we're feeling at any given moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just to, to maybe use another, another example is, um, actually here, no, I, I'll, I'll talk about another seminal study, which sort of inspired the heart rate one. And this, okay. this goes back a few, de- a couple decades. It's called the misattribution of arousal. So similar to yeah. the somatic heart rate, it's like, if we feel a certain sensation, maybe we're feeling anxious or we're sweating and, and it's not hot out and we're sort of like dizzy. Um, our brain wants nothing other than to find the source of that change of that physiological change. It wants to say, it wants to find the reason why we're feeling that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. And oftentimes when it does that, so it's trying to attribute the source of that arousal, the source of that emotion. And very often it does so erroneously and it does, it does a bad job of it. So we say, I'm feeling this way. It must be because of X when in fact it has nothing to do with X whatsoever. Okay. So that's misattribution of arousal. And in the seminal study in uh, BC, which is a Western province of Canada, the researchers there, um, what they did is they had people, this was a naturalistic field experiment and they had people. Is it, is it the bridge? Is this the, the high bridge, bridge one? one? You yes. got it. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> I love so they that had people study. go to the high bridge and uh, in one condition, they sort of induce this high arousal, this high emotional state through just physio- physical activity. And another, uh, it was just a, a normal amount of walking. So it was a, a normal amount of arousal activity. And then there was a, a confederate and a confederate is an individual who's actually part of the study. Um, and in this case, it was a, an attractive young female research associate, I believe. Or she, she, she offered their nu- her number, I believe, for, for the people to contact her after the study was complete. I think yeah, that could be, and then they counted arousal in the in the amount of contact that was exactly that was happening, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think the, that was it. 
like so i guess the outcome v- measure the the outcome variable was the ex- the, the, the whether the people or the men in this case the mm-hmm. male participants were going to reach out to the the attractive female confederate yeah. and they found that in the high arousal condition people were more likely to reach out and contact her and the reasoning they give the explanation is because they were highly aroused, not sexually, just like phys- through physical activity, mm. faster heart rate, skin sweating. And they inaccurately misattributed that physiological, autonomic, emotional state to being sexually aroused when, in fact, it didn't have anything to do with that. And instead, it just had everything to do with them being like uh, uh, theologically aroused, <laughs> tired, sweating. <laughs> I, I remember a, a study being done, though, which I remember it because it, it well, I wouldn't say shocked me because I, nothing really shocks me anymore. But I remember the study being done. And I think this was one by Ariely. At least it was done by something, some something, someone really, really famous. And mm-hmm. this was actually a study on on sexual arousal, where I think it was done on all male participants and they had to get themselves into a state of arousal. I think they were given a laptop and God knows how much porn. Don't ask me on the specifics of the study. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna get this study through ethics nowadays. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like they're not approving this. But then, you know, they had to get themselves into a state of sexual arousal specifically, and then they had to uh, answer some questions about whether it's okay to have sex with someone who's drunk, whether it's okay to have sex with someone who's significantly older than you, whether it's okay to have sex with an animal, et cetera, et cetera. So then it's huh. sexual arousal and I, I would argue moral and ethical decision-making. And uh, let's just put it this way. Self-control, maybe. Yeah, self-control. Ego or depletion. Ha- having yeah. any sense of decency, you know. <laughs> and then let's put it this way. You shouldn't make any decisions when sexually aroused. Don't, don't make any. Just don't do it. <laughs> There, there was a lot of difference. <laughs> yes, exactly, and and I mean that's that's true of of emotions is that they they like you know they're they're good and bad. They're neither good nor bad. It just depends on the context. It depends on the situation. But there's plenty of situations, both empirically and and just anecdotally, if you ask any person, that the emotions can totally bias and sway their their judgment and their decision making and their just behaviors in the moment. But there's also individual differences and variability of how, if whether a person can be aware of that so going right. back to that other point so that's that's why it's super important is to is to know when you're being swayed by your emotional state because uh, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't a lot of people don't don't recognize it in the heat of the in the heat of the moment and i think that another, might have been the title of the paper <laughs> yeah, yeah in the heat of the moment <laughs> I mean, but whatever i'll look it up it will be linked uh, in the description but yeah it was a it was an interesting read Psychologists mm-hmm. love their cutesy little titles. Oh yes, um, for sure. Oh yes. So it does. It does get at a at a distinction which is important in affective science, which is called the incidental and integral uh, sort of version of emotion. So mm-hmm. integral emotions and their effect on decision making means I'm made to feel happy or sad or whatever emotion it is, and it has a direct bearing on the judgment or the decision or my action in that very moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm conscious of it. Like, I'm like, I'm in a really shitty mood. I just had this bad meeting and now I'm feeling terrible and I have to sort of make a decision. And I know I'm not in the right place. Like that's, that's the integral emotion. The emotion is directly tied to the, to the subsequent context or situation. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes sense. But what, what is the more interesting one? I think and most people would agree are the incidental emotions. So the incidental and incidental emotions are those that um, happen in a particular context and usually outside of un- outside of conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. And we feel a certain way. And then there's this carryover effect from that situation at time one to another situation in time two, where mm-hmm. we're starting to make uh, unrelated decisions and judgments. And we're still being biased by the, the emotions that we're feeling from time one, but we don't know it. So a classic example that just to maybe bring it to life is um, you have a bad day, like, you know, a person has a bad day at the office, just just a really crappy day. Um, and, and they come home and, and they take it out on their on their spouse or their kids or the, the family pet. No, <laughs> I love how I go yeah, I like oh, the only pet got you. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell, people are kicking their dogs and stuff like, you know, oh people, my God, don't, Nick, I don't. I don't. My beautiful dog is sleep, sleeping behind me. I never kick her. But people do it. And, and people do much, far worse when it comes to being caught in the emotion, in that, in that emotional state. Um, 
so classic classic uh, seminal work by Jerry Clore and colleagues in the 80s and 90s found that uh, weather, ambient weather has a huge impact on people's reported happiness and life satisfaction. And they found that in a global study. <laughs> we live in the UK. Sarah and <laughs> I fucked this one up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why you guys are so pessimistic. It's always gray and stuff, right? <laughs> There's definitely some correlation. So that's that's an example of um, of of how that of how that happens, and and then you can actually prime it. So let's take two emotional states, for example. So let's take fear and anger. So both are seen as, in some ways, a, a, a ne- quote unquote negative emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, they're felt very differently mm-hmm. on on a very just sort of like you know, anecdotal layperson level um so when you incidentally prime someone so we're talking about these incidental emotions again so when you incidentally prime someone to feel fear or to feel afraid um they will actually see and then you and then you ask them questions about what do you think about the future what about you about like is this going to happen like what do you think is going to happen how do you feel about it they're they're going to be more much more likely to draw these pessimistic outcomes They're going to just see things like glass half empty kind of thing. There's Um, no glass at all. There's yeah, exactly. The glass is broken, which is, I think what it is. I think the glass is broken right now in our, in our current climate. Um, so, so th- th- this, and then you ask them, well, why do you, where are you drawing that from? And they're like, ah, that's just, I just feel that way. When in fact, it's because five minutes pre or 10 minutes previous, they were, they were meant to, to enter into, into the state of, of fear, but they don't know it. They don't know that their state of fear or feeling afraid mm-hmm. is biasing or impacting their, their uh, pessimistic judgments at time too. And then you compare that to the other group, the anger group, and those who are induced to feel a state of anger uh, are actually more optimistic in their future outcomes. Oh. So yeah, that's, uh, that's weird, right? At first. No, I don't find that weird at all. I've I've noticed this like purely anecdotally, but I'm very yeah. productive when I'm angry. So I don't mind getting angry. I find that quite a positive state to be in. So I'm going to ask you then, why why do you think that's the case? Like what would be your explanation? Not as a scientist, but as not, like not, a, not as a scientist, normal person. I, yeah, because yeah, I don't have a... <laughs> See, when I feel angry i don't know i've got i have a lot of energy but to some extent i also massively feel in control i don't know why is that it uh, am i right yeah, yeah you're right you win <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Emotional bingo. It. so when it comes to like emotions we have we draw these cognitive appraisals and it's these series of cognitive secondary appraisals which then lead to the sort of the output which is emotion that we call fear or emotion, uh, or anger, or sadness, or whatever it is, and one of the primary dimensions, uh, uh, you know, upon which we we draw these 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 different emotional states for anger is control or certainty. So when you're in a state of anger, the it's negative. Yes, it's usually social. You're usually angry. You're you're feeling anger towards another person, but it's high. It's it, it's on the dimension of certainty and control, it's it's rather high. You have a clear action. You have a clear course of action of what you need to do to resolve that 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 discrepant state, True. that feeling of anger. Whereas fear is very is incredibly low in certainty and control. So it's the result of that low versus high certainty and control between fear and anger, which predicts the likelihood of somebody feeling pessimistic or more optimistic. And that's why anger is a really, anger is an amazing emotional state because it's negative, as I said, but it's also very, very high in approach, what's called approach motivation. And it's the only one negative, it's the only one negative emotion, which is high in approach. Mm-hmm. All, most of all our other negative emotions like sadness, fear, panic are the opposite of approach, which is called avoidance. We withdraw, we hide, wow. we cower. Um, but mm. anger is this really interesting one, which although it's negative, it shares certain emotional and behavioral properties and qualities to positive states like happiness, joy, elation, excitement, et cetera. Yeah. See, you, you better be angry. Don't be scared. <laughs> be angry. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on how you channel that approach, right? You could channel it into something negative or positive as well. But I mean, from, from the collection of examples, like the small sample that you've, you've given us, um, just in this conversation, there seems to be so many powerful insights that, uh, we can learn about how to induce a specific emotional state that might lead people to make certain decisions. So it leads to some interesting ethical questions. Are there any examples of where companies or 
or people have used these insights to, I don't know, suit their own needs. Is yeah. this happening? Do people prime people into emotional states? I, it's a great question. I think, <clears throat> is it happening? Yes. Has it been happening for a very long time? Yes. Just look at advertisers and marketers over the last few decades. Sure. They're doing it because they know it makes sense. They're not doing it through like a very systematic scientific way, like IE behavioral economics, behavioral science, behavioral insights of the last 10 years. Okay. Very, very few. So when it comes to like, you know, your nudging and choice architecture kind of stuff, um, there's not much room. There's not much discussion of emotions and how um, emotions are influencing people's behaviors. Like just think about it. when we, when we talk about all your, 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 the typical list of biases and heuristics that are mentioned in, in, in nudge and predictably irrational and thinking fast and slow and all these things and all these books, um, they're always talked about in a very cognitive ish type way or okay. an emotionless way, mm -hmm. um, which is weird because I mean, just look at like loss aversion and look at, mm -hmm. uh, availability heuristic or any of these other classic ones they're highly emotional and yet mm -hmm. we're not actually going into though that work whether it's in policy or in for profit or not for profit we're not actually going in trying to induce certain emotional states there's exceptions so work by Jen Lerner and her colleagues as they're doing more on the ac on the academic side but those insights are now being pulled into practice mm -hmm. for like um I'm trying to think of a practical practical example smoking cessation uh so she's found with mm -hmm. her with her team a recent PNAS paper that just came out 2 months ago maybe where they actually found that inducing a state of sadness in smokers causes them to smoke more not less oh which is super counterintuitive and obviously it's the, the policymakers didn't get the memo 10 20 years ago because in canada and in europe and in recently in the us when you buy a pack of smokes on the front package is this really disturbing image of somebody mm. suffering from lung cancer or like a really gross image it either induces disgust or sadness yeah so what they've actually been doing inadvertently this whole time for 10, 15, 20 years is inducing a mass state of sadness in smokers, which they thought was actually going to curb their smoking. But it makes it worse. But it makes it worse and it makes them actually smoke more. Is that wow. because they're seeking a way to get rid of their sadness? Like a sort of like a comfort blanket, which for a smoker is a cigarette? Exactly. So I'm there's, good at this. <laughs> I feel so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> that's part I, th I think there's part speculation of, of why and i i'm i'm if you for your listeners if i'll send the paper so you can put it in the, uh, oh, in the show notes and they might have actually assessed process through through some mediation model um which i'm drawing a blank on so i don't want to speculate and guess but they sure, might sure. have actually said wh why that's the case and offered and offered an explanation but i believe it's along it's something along those lines yeah, yeah for the audience please do read the uh, the scientific explanation not yeah. me just <laughs> randomly guessing yeah. what i think might be right it's, it's not a very yeah. scientific approach but i am surprised i mean with the sadness i'm not very surprised with but does disgust work because yeah. i thought disgust would work really well yeah that's what that was because i had jen on the show when i uh, and she, this was just in press when I spoke with her. And that was my question. I was like, well, what about disgust? To me, it seems like eliciting a state of disgust would turn people off. And I mm -hmm. think uh, if I remember correctly, she was saying like, stay tuned. There, there's work following up to see oh. what the, I, I, my, I have a strong hunch and hypothesis that disgust would lead to reduced smoking. Just, just given the sort of the functionalist adaptationist explanation of disgust, which is to, to shut down, to pull away, to close mm -hmm. up, right. uh, yeah, is, is a very avoidant state. I mean, I, I guess it depends on how effective these uh, sort of stickers on cigarette packets are now in evoking disgust. Because you know, once you've once something's become normal, does that take away its shock factor? Like, is there a sort of a time limit on these sort of interventions? Yeah, exactly. You habituate to those, and that's just people in my own life that's exactly what happens they they just they don't see they don't mm. see it and, and it, it becomes an inattention blindness thing where they like they've seen it enough times and it doesn't have an impact anymore but that's that's one example but there's there's plenty of other ones so um i guess we can break it down into into two ways of when emotions help versus when emotions don't mm -hmm. um, or when they hinder our our judgment and decision making so in what in one case um 
we know that when we're, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, when we're caught in the heat of the moment, when mm-hmm. our emotions are running high, we will, we will often make bad decisions. So what companies and governments can do is recognize when people are more likely to be in a sort of a, a high state of, of emotional sway mm-hmm. and interrupt the process so that they don't, so that they either slow down the decision making or they they don't let it happen. So for instance, there's certain gun laws in certain states and also in various countries outside the US where there's a there's a sort of a period of waiting mm-hmm. to go from like registering for the gun and then eventually like to the very end of getting the gun. Yeah. That's intentional by design through policy because you can imagine if you have somebody who's feeling enraged for whatever reason and they want to go on a shooting spree, which mm-hmm. happens unfortunately all too often in the US, yeah. um, having that waiting period is tremendous, tremendously important and can and can be life, life-saving potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of social media channels are starting to do this well. I don't know if it's Instagram or Twitter where you if they recognize that you're posting something that is like sort of highly emotional or highly negative, Mm -hmm. they will uh, send you a a notification or sort of a follow-up push notification that says, are you sure you want to send this? So it's a very brief little check that says to the user, you're probably in a really highly emotional state. Um, Are you sure you want to do this? Right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an example of when we can use, our knowledge and insights of affective science and emotions to slow down the decision-making process. Um, And on the opposite end, we also know that emotions are great. Like emotions are amazing for us to to compel us to move, to get Mm -hmm. us into action, right? To put us into a moment where we need to act. If if I had to say, not me, this is researchers who said this, if we had to say, the primary function or purpose of an emotion, what, what is it? It's to get us ready for action. What Nico Friday mm-hmm. called action, a state of action readiness, right? It's to mobilize, to move. Um, so given that, we know uh, from, you know, classic behavioral economics and, and, and other similar work that we are terrible at saving for the long term, mm-hmm. right? Because of temporal discounting and, and hyperbolic delay, blah, blah, blah. So what is helpful is if we can get people to see their future selves in a more emotional way so that they bring in line the current self, it's almost as like they're mentally time traveling to a future self of themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and and what we know is that's going to work. That's going to be more likely to work. It's going to be more effective if you bring an emotional state into that moment of imagining or envisioning the future self, um, because that's what emotions do. So that's some stuff that I know people are starting to work on, but there's so much, so much more can be done. Um, oh, on one... that topic, then I'm quite curious. How do you see the the future for this field of research? What do you think is going to happen in the next five, ten, God knows how many years? Or what would you like to happen? Maybe a better question. I would like to see emotions take like take the front and center stage. Um, I, th- I think what we're seeing in behavioral insights and applied behavioral science right now is what we saw of emotions research in academia in like the mid 20th century, where it's an afterthought, it's emotions are considered a byproduct. It's not really like built into the core of our interventions and the work that we do. Mm-hmm. What I think we need to start doing is 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 bringing it and 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 putting us putting a spotlight on it. Um, um. And, and getting the people who have the training, whether from academia or through practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, there's people who, there's certainly people who come, who come to mind, but um, we probably need somebody to write a book like, you know, like Dan Ariely or like a version of Dan Ariely who writes a book on behavioral insights through a specific lens of emotions and affective science. Yeah. Jen, Jen Lerner would be a good, I'm thinking of academics or Lisa Feldman Barrett on like the affective neuroscience side but mm-hmm. she she has an amazing she does have an amazing book but one that is geared more towards practitioners i think would be the thing we need to really launch this forward and i think mm-hmm. it's going to happen because it's it, there's such power to it really i have a quick last question to sneak in um mm-hmm. so we've predominantly been talking about fear anger happiness which are known as uh, primary emotions whether shame and guilt are known as secondary emotions do you think secondary emotions are less powerful in driving decision making? Are are the primary emotions the strongest? Do you think? <sighs> that's a that's a good question. 
I, I would say no. Okay. I think it's. I think they're highly context dependent. Okay. I think we, we're we're led to believe that the primary emotions, just by virtue of that name, primary, mm -hmm. have like a, a stronger effect, a stronger pull on our behaviors mm -hmm. uh, and our decision making. Um, but there are there are plenty of scenarios and situations where the secondary, i.e., more complex or more nuanced emotional states like shame, guilt, elation, joy, mm -hmm. um, will have just as big an effect. Okay. Um, and I guess I should say I'm not surprised because um, our understanding of emotions is is much more sophisticated now since like Paul Ekman's basic emotions of like the 60s and 70s, where he's like, there's six basic emotion states and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, we know through neuroscience, like Le with um, Lisa Feldman Barrett and other people's work, that the appraisal or the constructionist approach of emotions is a much more accurate way to understand the richness of and the tapestry of human emotions and emotional experiences that we have. Um, and also the, the, the dependencies on cultural context and cultural upbringing matter. So I think it, I think it's highly context dependent, culturally dependent. Uh, but there are plenty of, of instances where those more complex secondary emotions are, are equally as powerful. Okay. Good to know. So next time I want something from you, Sarah, I'll just guilt trip you. That's fine. You always do anyway. <laughs> That's a, this fine. is true. <laughs> Nothing new. No. And, and, you know, and last point, if 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 you don't mind, um, is that sort of piggybacking off of that last response mm -hmm. is for people and the one before that, <laughs> for people who are doing this work, follow along, listeners. For people who are doing Ooh. this work in the next decade. Um, it's not going to be so simple as here are your six emotion states. Boom, boom, do this. There's only six. It's easy to do. No, human emotions are ridiculously nuanced and complex. And there's so much overlap between cognition and emotion. Um, and, and, and so it's, it, it's going to be incumbent on us to, to do that good work in, in practice and in, in academia to, to see exactly the, where those nuances play out and how they exactly impact uh, human behavior. Fascinating. So I guess that would be your your final message to the listeners. Yeah. Yeah. This work is is necessary. It's important, but it's difficult, and we've got to get it right. Otherwise, there could be some unintended bad unintended consequences for policy. Mm. Right. Of these of insights that aren't quite uh, you know precise enough or produced yeah. in a precise scientific way. Yeah. Exactly. Or you have people doing them who don't understand and, and, and talk about unintended consequences. Like there could be some, some really nefarious and sinister work that's being done that has been done by certain marketers and maybe social media uh, companies in the past. Mm. And, uh, and so I think we need the people who, who are doing that work, who know what it's about so that they can do it for quote unquote, for good. Okay. Yes. Nice. Now you Actually, you've plugged a lot of different people and their work. Now, the very last question for our episodes is always, where can people find you to stay up to date with your work and everything you're doing? So this is your moment to plug yourself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you want to en engage me and, and de more, more debate me, I love having debate and fr friendly debate on LinkedIn. You can find me. You can find me there. Very active on there. Um, you can find me at thebehaviorist.biz and uh, thebehaviorist.biz slash BS podcast. So I uh, do a lot of interesting conversations on my sh on my podcast called It's All Just a Bunch of BS. Um, <laughs> Which, by so the way, love that. great name. Excellent. Yes. Name. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I was worried. No, I love it. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be um, realistic. Like, even if you're like the best behavioral scientist ever, if you don't have a sense of humor, just fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show. We really appreciated you taking the time out of your day. It's been thanks wonderful for, to meet uh, you and speak to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, and what a what a note to end on, eh, Merla? I'll, I'll second yeah. that. <laughs> Excellent. There we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you.
so that was us talking to Nick Hobson about emotional decision making. And I I thought it was an absolutely great conversation. I'm I'm happy to now know that, you know, I'm not like some weirdo who gets off on, on feeling <laughs> angry. I'm uh, I'm glad to know this is actually like a scientifically explainable thing. <laughs> no, but it's it's weird, right? I always oh, thought like God. most people they get angry and of course like you see red and whatever. I just get productive, but apparently that's that's completely normal. So I'm 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 quite pleased with that. If that's the only thing I get yeah. out of this episode, yeah. that's still that's still good for me, you know. I like how you the- thought that that was your superpower to be able to no! channel your anger into extreme productivity. I no, like not my <laughs> superpower. Just like an a, an oddity, like you know, like some kind of weird defect, like to, I know programming in my head not going right or whatever. Mm. But yeah, no, cool. What did you get away from this? Take away <laughs> from this. Um, so I, I mean, I've always really been interested in emotions and effective response, especially the role that it plays in behavior and behavior change. But I think something that I took away is that actually we've been thinking of emotion as like a secondary character in this story when I think it should be probably the one of the protagonists, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Yeah. So I, I thought what was really interesting was the the link between a physiological response and the emotion. So certain emotions may produce similar physiological responses. Mm-hmm. And so that that leads to this weird potential priming effect where if you can invoke a physiological response, the brain maybe takes a bit of a, a leap and uh, thinks that it's feeling some kind of emotion. Uh, I don't know how, I mean... I know that you, Mella, are not uh, so convinced by priming effects. So how does this no. sit with you? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I actually have to clarify this. So um, from behavioral science, a lot of if you if you look at uh, decision making that is not necessarily focused on emotional decision making. So it, it doesn't mess about with emotions. In that case, the priming studies, they don't really replicate. Like, you know, if you smell... Uh, cleaner in the air you know you you tend to tidy up better after yourself or whatever (laughs) like that that is some like typical behavioral stuff it didn't replicate or sometimes the effects are really really small this is also dependent on the fact that the samples are really really small so if you test the proper size sample you might not even have found an effect um which you know it's all a learning curve but i'm not convinced by behavioral priming if i'm being very honest although uh, in this case smell is a very very strong sense i'm not that convinced um wait isn't yeah isn't sorry to jump in but isn't is there a distinction between sort of priming in terms of external stimuli so based on sensory uh, information and priming your sort of internal stimuli. So, is there a difference between changing the smell in the room uh, versus, you know, having someone listen to the sound of a heartbeat? I don't know if there's a difference, but it seems to me that you know, changing the smell in the room is much more external than actually changing someone's, in this case, perceived heartbeat. Mm. Uh, because you, I mean, changing someone's actual heartbeat, you, you're gonna have to be, you know, you have to like make them do jumping jacks or whatever. So I feel like they <laughs> might attribute to where the fast heartbeat's coming from. Mm. But I think that was really interesting. I do think if if you can mess about with someone's emotions, I do think this will have a much stronger impact, um, because. And yeah, like you said, the, like priming in this case, like it tends to be done subconsciously. It's not entirely sure. Um, like the, the person can't figure out where, where the source of their behavior is coming from, whether it's an increased heartbeat that is not actually theirs or a smell. But I don't know. I, I think it's 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 str- I think it's different. I think it's it's stronger. I'm, I'm more likely to, to buy it from a scientific mm. point of view. I don't know why. But the, I mean, the, the <laughs> thing that I like most about the... Um, about the study with the heartbeat is that it's such clear deception. I love that stuff. I'm a oh. psychologist by training, so I love studies that use oh deception. Gosh. I can't I can't explain to you how much the hairs on the back of my neck stood up when when I was like, wait, but it's it's not their actual heartbeat. You're deceiving them. And yes. I think that just yeah, obviously points to the differences between an economist and a psychologist. The fact yes. that I just I'm so uncomfortable with deception. It's been ingrained into me, into my training. But um, I think but no, it's I, ironic. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's ironic right. that the average economist, especially if they have to run studies or you know do more scientific work, that I get told, "Oh no, you know you you can't deceive people." And I'm like, "Well, what is your entire field about then?" 
no shade. All shade. <laughs> well, well, I mean, coming there from a... There is so much deception. Coming from a psychologist. Come on. I mean, you might not have deception in your experimental setup, but you have got plenty of deception going on in the real world application of economics. And no one tell me nothing about that not being <laughs> true. No, that's that's uh, there's definitely some commentary in there somewhere. <laughs> um, anyway, back I... to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I I think what what you were saying about uh, emotional decision making and sort of there's a lot of power uh, that choice architects can potentially utilize by you know producing certain emotions uh, in certain interventions but what we also heard is how you know almost there's so much that we know so little that there's a lot of room mm -hmm. for interventions to backfire and to fail for example the cigarette uh, pictures on the cigarette packet campaign yeah not an interesting one, though, because we're talking about uh, cigarette packets again. I, I just finished reading a book on Dutch inheritance law. Don't ask. And um, <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is a section on there uh, about copyright infringement of the um, portrait rights of someone who has died. And what happened, and this, this is god-awful, so this is something interesting to keep in mind when you see those vile images on like any package, whether it's cigarettes or whatever, that... There was a, ver I don't know the cigarette brand nor the country that this happened in, but I'm assuming it happened in the Netherlands, where a, a woman, a widow who just lost her husband, um, saw, because of someone else who smoked, she didn't smoke herself and neither did her husband, and that's quite important. Mm. She saw a cigarette package and on the package was someone, you know, who's in a hospital looking very, very ill, wired up to every possible machine you can think of. And then, you know, the, the warning line of this could happen to you, you know, stop smoking now. This is what you're doing to yourself. This, this is your future, whatever. You know, very, very threatening, very playing towards, towards fear. And what turned out is that it was her recently deceased husband who was on the package who, um, first of all, she, no one ever consented to those pictures being taken. Like the widow nor the very much now deceased husband knew anything about those pictures being taken. And the kicker is the man never smoked. He didn't die of lung cancer related diseases. So, no, if, you, if you want to talk about deception. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that, there it is right there. <laughs> Like, I oh, can't even gosh. imagine. I don't think this woman experienced sadness, disgust, or fear when looking at this package. I think it might have just been pure shock. So oh, there you have yeah. another emotion added into the mix. Oh, God. What a story. <laughs> yeah. Dutch inheritance well, facts or laws, books, mate. This is where it's at. <laughs> well, we hope that we haven't primed you accidentally with feelings of disgust or, or sadness today. Um, no, stay we'll with go... us. Love us. <laughs> yeah, we will... <laughs> We were going for maybe some more positive emotions, um, but there we go. We we live and learn. So thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening. You're the See dummy ya. that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the one I love. You're the one I want to give to. Things that